Hi, welcome to Elizabeth's Kind Cafe. I'm Elizabeth Katzman, and today we are joined by Andy Acho, environmental initiatives expert and former worldwide director of environmental outreach and strategy for Ford Motor Company. Andy is also a nationally recognized expert on practical environmental initiatives that help make the world a better place and save money. Since retiring from Ford in 2006, Andy has become a valuable resource for organizations interested in protecting the environment and improving performance. He is also a contributing author to the book Becoming a Green Innovator, Encouraging um, Green Business Practices. We are also joined today by Kevin Donnelly. Kevin is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Grand River Printing and Imaging. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Delighted to be here. Thank uh, you. So let's talk a little bit about what brings the two of you together. Maybe, Kevin, you can address what's coming up in the near future. Well, we are holding a Earth Day educational event on uh, April 21st at the Detroit Institute of Arts uh, in the morning. Uh, and we are very pleased that Andy will be our featured speaker for that uh, event, which is being held to provide the uh, Detroit community with uh, information about how to be sustainable and uh, what measures people can take to uh, preserve the environment and be more effective at what they do, whether it be in business or in their personal lives. Okay, so this is the fourth year you're putting on this event. This year it's practical sustainability. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you hope to address this year as opposed to the previous three years? Well, in the past we focused uh, largely on um, the question of climate change and uh, global warming and some of the scientific topics uh, related to the issues that uh, we all face in the world today. Uh, but we felt having Andy come in and talk about his uh, long experience uh, in business to talk about what measures people can actually take and give examples of successful efforts to have an impact, uh, whether it be in uh, corporate uh, business or in uh, uh, personal matters. And what personally made you become interested in putting on a conference like this and being so dedicated because it's obviously uh, quite an investment to, to do an event like this every year? Well, there were a number of factors. Um, you know, uh, we've had a lot of discussion in our industry. I, I work in the printing and graphic arts industry. There's been a lot of changes in the recent past uh, affecting how paper is procured and all of the issues related to how the print manufacturing process is, is uh, carried out in terms of its uh, impact on the environment. Uh, but as we began to discuss this with our clients and, and the people in our immediate uh, environment, we saw a tremendous need for education and that uh, there was in fact a lot of things happening uh, in all sectors of the economy with, with companies and also government and uh, organizations trying to do what they can to uh, improve uh, their impact on the environment and, and uh, we, we saw this as a, a need that, that could be filled by bringing people together in an environment where they can learn more about these uh, processes. And uh, are you putting on this event by yourself? Do you have sponsors? Yeah, we're joined, uh, Grand River Printing and Imaging is joined by 21 other companies who are sponsoring the event, uh, who are companies that we do business with and also others that are active in the green initiatives uh, sector of our economy to help uh, put this program together. It is a free event, it's open to the public. Uh, we encourage uh, people to sign up to uh, register to attend. Uh, it is in the morning from 8 a.m. to noon on uh, the 21st of April. And where can people register? Uh, they can register online uh, by going to our company website, which is uh, www.grpinc.com. And there's a, a link at the bottom of the page where they can uh, uh, go to sign up to attend. And are they able to register on the day of, or is space limited? Are you close uh, to being? We, we do have a limit uh, in terms of the number of seats available in the, in the uh, lecture hall, where Andy, where Andy will be giving his presentation. Uh, 375 uh, spaces available, so it is important that people register early uh, online uh, in advance. 
So it's basically a, a morning event, the, the first from 8 to 12. Mm -hmm. and maybe you can give us a, a rough outline of how the day will go. Okay, well, uh, the program starts at 8 o'clock in the morning where people will come in. They will be serving, it will be serving a uh, buffet breakfast, and then uh, there'll be an opportunity to interact with the sponsoring companies who will be hosting uh, booths in the display uh, exhibit area. Uh, to talk about the environmental uh, and sustainable products and services that they are offering. Uh, and then uh, that goes till 9.30, and then Andy will give his presentation from 9.30 to 11. Uh, there'll be a, a period of time for questions and discussion in the lecture hall, and then we will return to the uh, Kresge Court where the exhibits are for coffee afterwards, and uh, people in attendance will have an opportunity to meet uh, the speaker. An hour and a half, Elizabeth, will probably put people to sleep. So we're not <laughs> going to do that. You know, they give you coffee in the morning to wake you up, and then they give you speakers to put you to sleep. <laughs> we're not going to do that. So the presentation will probably be closer to 45 minutes to an hour, okay. and then open it for questions and answers so that people can get whatever it is that's on their mind. All right. Maybe you could give us an idea of what what you may be discussing. Well, what we're going to be talking about is different initiatives. When we talk about practical sustainability, people hear words like sustainability and say, geez, what's that? And we talk about needing a sustainable future. With all the things that are going on, all of us have a footprint on the environment. So what we need to do is find a way to reduce that. But how do you do it? What, what practical sustainability is about is making sure that we have the materials that we need to do whatever we want today, but leave enough so that future generations can take whatever actions they need. So I'll be talking about the subtitle of the practical sustainability is really reducing, mm -hmm. reusing, right. recycling, yep. and reaping rewards. Right, that's the key, right? That is the key. Yeah. Because at Ford, you know, Henry Ford was a super environmentalist way before the term environmentalist came to be when he first started Ford Motor Company. He did all kinds of things to minimize waste. As an example, he would order bearings from a company called Timken. He'd tell them what kind of wooden boxes to put them in. That's well, incredible. People laughed at him. Why right. do you tell me what kind of wood? Well, what they found out later is after he took the bearings out, he used the wood as floorboards for the Model T and on the side of the Woody station wagons. So it's always a step ahead of how he, he was can, a step ahead. how to reduce. And the leftover wood became Kingsford charcoal. Oh. Kingsford was actually a relative of Henry Ford's wife. So they took the leftover wood, was able to grind it down and make the charcoal the first briquettes. So that was a start. He made his suits out of soybeans. And for quite a while, Ford Motor Company, after Henry Ford the first, kind of lost track of the environment until Bill Ford came along. Around 1960, when I first started working for him on environmental matters, he decided that Ford Motor Company wasn't doing enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to worry about our great grandkids. And so he decided that we needed a group that was going to be focusing on finding things that are good for the environment and good for the bottom line. Right. Right, you need both, because otherwise it's not practical. Right. Well, that's it. And, and what it was, it, people did not want to do something that ended up costing more or reducing the effectiveness of the product. So one of the things we formed was the Recycling Action Team, the Rat Patrol. <sighs> and what we decided is we were going to find ways for Ford to use recycled materials. Now, we already were recycling paper, recycling cardboard, recycling printer toner cartridges. Just in the office. In the offices. Yeah. We had a hundred different offices with our green berets uh -huh. that were doing that. And they did it and that made sense. And we reduced the telephone books and all our, th turned off our computers when they weren't used, turned off the lights. Right. But big Ford Motor Company has to do a lot more right. than just recycle. So we are users of material. So in creating the recycling action team, we set up guidelines. We're going to use recycled plastic, recycled rubber in our products, post-consumer, after it's been used, uh -huh. with two guidelines. Guideline number one is that the product had to be as good as or better than the product you replace. Right. You can't sacrifice durability, quality, or reliability. You do that, you're not helping the environment because the thing fails 
consumers aren't going to buy it. Well, and I think it's such a misconception, too, that people think just because it's recycled, made from post-consumer recycled, and they, and they think, oh, well, it's already been used before, and now you're going to put into something else. They think it's flimsy. It's not going to stand you up. You absolutely captured the way our engineers thought. Because mm. I remember going to one of our chief engineers and saying, we have this tail lamp housing made out of recycled plastic. And his answer was, why do I want to use that crap? For people who are new. I said, but this meets all of your guidelines. No, no, I said, I've already got stuff that meets my guidelines. I said, what if we could prove to you it has the durability, quality, reliability, and save you money? Then he became interested. And as a result, right. Ford Motor Company ended up using 50 million two-liter pop bottles a year for car parts, and we saved millions of dollars. A billion bottle caps became heating and air conditioning components, and we saved money. Three million uh, housings were made out of recycled nylon from old carpeting. <laughs> Ten million tires were recycled, and I'll tell you more about that yeah. later. But we did all kinds of great things. Isn't that incredible? All of that would otherwise be in the landfills. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about throwing things away. Ask your kids, where is a way? You know, wh wh where is it? Well, see, my kids, they'll tell you that they're going to put it in the recycling. It's going to make more toys. Exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what you should be doing with it. That is the reusing if they can. Right. And if they not, they recycle. Right. And there are all kinds of opportunities like that. And those are just minor initiatives I'm telling you about compared to what we've done at Ford. But even from the beginning of Ford, you know, it's just amazing what vision that they had because he knew even though it's, it's nice to have a love for the environment and, you know, there's a, a group of people and the group is getting bigger, of people who really do care and go from a place of wanting to help the environment. But to at the same time have the recognition that you have to show people how they're going to save money and or make money doing that also because the love for the environment is just not going to cut it for most people. There are a lot of activists who love the environment and we had them at Ford, quite a few of them, they were terrific. All we had to do then is concentrate on how it is you can take what is good intention right. and turn it into a business benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did. Water conservation. Ford Motor Company has saved seven billion gallons a year uh, in terms of the way we used to do business. An example of when we paint a car red with a spray gun mm -hmm. and the next one is blue, you have to flush out all the red out of the paint gun. Right. Well, what do you do with that? Well, we at Ford capture all of that material, the paint and the solvent, send it to a Michigan company, uh, Gage is the name of the company, they take it, they separate the paint from the solvent, bring the solvent back to the original spec, send it back to us, using it over and over again, we have saved 225 million pounds from going to landfills. That's incredible. It's hard to imagine 225 million, so I went to it the is. internet, yeah. found out what an African elephant, Asian elephant, male and female weigh and how long they are, yeah. 12,000 pounds, 15 feet. 53 miles of elephants end to end did not go to landfills and we saved 75 wow. million dollars. That's, That's practical incredible. sustainability. Yes. So is this the message that you're hoping to give at the conference for practical well, sustainability? Well, I will absolutely not only give that message, yeah. but give them some additional things that their business partners, the community, mm -hmm. the general public can see, you know what? People can make a difference. All of this was a vision of one person at Ford. It was Bill Ford. Way before others talked about the environment, I'm talking more than 20 years, he's been preaching this message. He wasn't listened to. Now it's getting to be, hey, you know, you were right about this. Right. So with Bill as a champion, a group of us were able to accomplish quite a bit. One of the important things the local people can see is the Ford Rouge plant. If you haven't been there, I suggest you yeah, take your kids. Yeah, we want to take a tour, yes. We're talking about the world's, well, it was the icon of 20th century manufacturing built by Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. Now it is the icon of 21st century sustainable manufacturing. It's got the world's largest living roof, 10.4 acres, a Guinness World Book of Records. It's in there. And what makes it living? It makes it living because it's got sedum that's on there that doesn't grow, that doesn't have to be taken care of, and it absorbs rainwater so that 
we don't have to worry about the rainwater going into the ground and going into the Rouge River. We, uh, it, it, we don't have to fertilize it. We don't have to water it. We don't have to cut it. Uh, in addition, the Rouge facility has uh, a parking lot, which is porous. When it rains, the water goes through the parking lot, goes into a swale, a high price word for ditch. Yeah. As it travels, it goes through bushes and trees, and it's filtered before it goes into the Rouge River. Wow. So you're sending in clean water, yeah. and you're keeping it from running into the river at a fast pace. And we can take the kids there for tours. Absolutely. They, they would love to learn that. about that. And there's a lot more. There's phytoremediation plants. There's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a fantastic uh, view of what a plant can be ergonomically friendly uh, for the workers. And we have bees. We have apples. We have geothermal. We have all kinds of things at the plant. Right. So when we come back, let's talk a little bit more about Ford, its initiatives, and how you helped bring them to fruition. And we'll also talk a little bit more about the Conference for Practical Sustainability. We'll be right back at Elizabeth's Kind Cafe with Kevin Donnelly and Andy Acho. Hi, I'm Teddy Bruschi. And I'm Jerome Bettis. For years, we knocked heads on the football field every time the Pittsburgh Steelers and New England Patriots played. But now we're teaming up to help people all across America who are uninsured and struggling financially. It's the Partnership for Prescription Assistance, and it's already helped more than 6 million Americans in need in all 50 states. If you or someone you know needs help paying for medicine, call 1-888-4-PPA-NOW or visit our website at www.pparx.org to see if you may qualify. It's a free service, a free phone call, and you can get your medicines for free too. Winning the Super Bowl is a great feeling. Winning three is even better. But so is helping millions of Americans who are uninsured and struggling. Call the Partnership for Prescription Assistance toll-free number now. The PPA team is standing by to help. Hey, you know I was just kidding about the three championships. Well, if Hi, welcome back to Elizabeth's Kind Cafe. We are joined again by Andy Acho and Kevin Donnelly, and we're talking a little bit about the upcoming conference on practical sustainability and initiatives that Andy has helped to improve the environment and make it economically beneficial. Let me correct you. Andy hasn't done that as a <laughs> team at Ford Motor Company. I just happen to have the pleasure to have been a, uh, one of the leaders in that area. But you're the one where you got the perseverance, you keep going, you Well, Bill up Ford, again, is the guy that really had the vision and, well, I got to say, you know, the support that he provided all of us at Ford to make these things happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. I'm going to give you a minor gift for your two boys. Aww. These are pencils made out of recycled blue jeans. Really? Now, why do we have pencils made Thank out of recycled you. blue jeans? Why? Because Ford uses recycled blue jeans in their vehicles. In fact, there is a whole team today at Ford's scientific innovation lab, uh, primarily led, actually almost exclusively led by women. We have Deb Maluski, uh, we have Cynthia Flanagan, two PhDs, who have teams to look at recycled plastic, to look at recycled rubber, to look at renewables, whether it's soy or straw or anything else, Ford can use it so that they can do the right thing for the environment and save money. And where in the vehicle are they using recycled jeans and recycled Well, plastic? we started doing that in the 90s back in engine compartments as uh, a way to deaden the noise. And so that's just one of the many things. I mean, it's, it's uh, that and recycled rubber was used. So what? it's a matter of finding a good fit for something uh, and, again, make sure you don't compromise durability, quality, right. reliability. Make sure it makes financial sense. And tell us a little bit about what you've done with the tires, because obviously there's a lot of tires that could potentially go into landfills. So well, actually, a lot of them still do. 300 million tires a year are retired. Uh, some of them go to landfills. A lot of them are used for fuel. They actually burn them in cement kilns. Well, what Ford decided to do is find a way to be able to use recycled rubber. We started in early 90s using it for brake pedal pads, but we've gone way beyond that, and we decided when we had a, a lot of tires to worry about to turn lemons into lemonade. Mm -hmm. What we did is we had 10 million tires collected. 
We had them cut up. We had them frozen with liquid nitrogen until it became like glass, shattered into millions of pieces. A magnet pulled out all the metal. Air blew off the fiber. And what's left is crumb rubber. And then a lot of it is like coarse ground pepper. Okay. So you use that in football fields, soccer fields, running tracks, therapeutic riding arenas. Let me tell you about that. You have a horse arena. Yeah. You put this rubber down. Horses walk on it. It's softer. It's quieter. Makes the uh, horses calmer. And they take physically and mentally handicapped kids for therapy. Wow. And something about a horse's gait uh -huh. does something to a kid's spine. Yes. And I've talked to moms whose kids couldn't walk before having this therapy. Yeah. This stuff can be used in roads. Ford contributed all of the rubber to make 122 miles of roads in New Mexico. It's quieter by 3 dBA. It lasts longer. We did 50 miles of roads in Arizona. Um, wow, so less repairs. Less repairs and a longer period of time. I yeah. just wish we'd do that in Michigan. I was not able to accomplish that. Yeah, we, you tried to get it going in Michigan? And we tried, but yeah. maybe, maybe they're looking at it now to uh -huh. see if they can be uh, utilizing recycled rubber. Football fields. Ford Field is a super environmentally responsible stadium. It's state of the art. Not only is a football field made with recycled rubber, which by the way, not only is good for the environment, but it lowers the amount of injuries to the lower body. It softens the impact? It softens the impact, but yeah. also when a football player is running, uh -huh. it's the ground that gives instead of their ankles. Wow. Before, all they had was a fr practically a carpet on top of blacktop. Right. So it was not soft and it didn't give. So those are some of the uses. Mulch is made out of recycled rubber. The mulch at my house is eight years old. So they take these pieces, painted with non-volatile organic compound paints, treated with ultraviolet light, and it's lasted so far for eight years. And what do you see for the automotive industry for the future, for sustainable Well, that's an interesting question because I think that it cannot be sustainable the way it is now. Mm -hmm. When you've got something in the order of magnitude of 900 million vehicles in the world, I just came from California. And let me tell you, the roads there are awful in terms of yeah. the amount of traffic. Yeah. You, just, you just stop when you're on a 101 or on a 405 and you really can't go anywhere. Well, imagine building a lot more uh, vehicles and having a lot more people in India and China and all the rest. They want transportation too, and why shouldn't they? But two billion is gonna be a little difficult to manage. Sustainable transportation is important, and we've gotta find different ways. Number one, the vehicles have to get a lot more fuel economy. Right. And fortunately, that's happening. You have a lot more vehicles that get you 40 miles to the gallon. Number two, you have to have different technology. Hybrids is, uh, are out there now. Quite a few hybrids are working. And the way a hybrid works, I don't know if people really know, you're talking about a gas engine, you're talking about batteries. Right, I think it's confusing because they have batteries, yet you don't need to plug it in. That's right. So how does Well, the you don't need to plug that in. There's also an electric uh, battery plug-in uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But what you're talking about is a vehicle that runs on batteries as you're driving slow, but whenever you speed up, you use the engine. But every time you're braking, you're creating heat. And so that regenerative braking, you're using that energy from that heat mm. for batteries. So you're charging the batteries as you're driving. That's incredible. So that's great. And that, by the way, that is terrific for stop and go driving. So if you have errands with your kids and shopping and all that, that's great. If you do a lot of highway driving, yeah. frankly, hybrids shouldn't be for you mm -hmm. because they give you 75% better fuel economy in inner city driving, but they only give you about 15% on highways. But then now, now are you- Are they priced a little bit higher than- And they are priced higher. Yeah. And so therefore, from a pure economic standpoint, right. you don't get your money back unless you do a lot of that kind of stop and go driving. It takes several years to get payback. And where do we stand with the electric car? Well, the electric cars are starting to be introduced. The Chevy Volt has already come out. The Nissan Leaf has already come out. Ford has got something that they're introducing. And what you're talking about is a vehicle that you can just plug in mm -hmm. overnight. The problem with electric vehicles, I think they're terrific potentially because uh, you're able to drive uh, and not have to stop for gas ever. The problem is the range. They don't go far enough yet. Even when they say they have a range of 100 miles, they're talking about ideal conditions. 
You're talking about not using air conditioning, you're talking about not using a heater. But that's going to get perfected. It's going to get better and better. And the nice thing about it is it'll be easy to plug in in your garage. You're going to be able to plug it in and you're going to be able to tell it when to charge. And it can charge when your electric rates are lowest in the middle of the night when people are not using uh, heat and air conditioning. And how about ethanol for flex fuel cars? Well, ethanol is something that we at Ford have had for a long, long time. I remember having a press conference in the 90s with the uh, governor of Illinois surrounded by seven bushels of corn because that's how much it takes to be able to fill a Taurus at that time. <laughs> and the ethanol aspect is the fact that we don't use oil, but you're also using corn, which may be used for other products. Uh, you don't get the fuel economy out of ethanol that you do out of gasoline. We've had a hundred years of gasoline usage that's improved the fuel economy. Excuse me. So ethanol doesn't get it to you there, but again, it's one way for energy security. I think it's yeah. important that we continue to keep that. But you're going to see something even better down the road. Uh, a number of things are happening. Uh, the engines are getting a lot better. Mm -hmm. Diesels, I think, is something that Americans haven't used. Right. About 1% of the vehicles in the U.S. are diesels. 50% of sales in Europe are diesel. Really? Absolutely. That's and I think it is, Americans still remember the old diesel buses 25 years ago that were belching smoke, yeah. you know, that were loud. It's right. no longer that way. They've really got them so that they're a lot better today. Also, hydrogen. You're going to see that down the road. Right. Your kids are going to be driving vehicles you know, that run on hydrogen. If you get a fuel cell vehicle, and I've driven them, they're not practical yet. You're talking about a million dollars for a vehicle. Wow. But you're talking about a vehicle. But you've driven them? Oh, yeah. Well, you've driven Ford them has been in the scientific yeah. research lab, has had those vehicles for 10 years. And we've been pushing and trying to get more out of them. If you can run it on hydrogen, then what you're really doing is... If you know about, remember electrolysis, you uh, introduce electricity into water and you separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. This is the opposite. You get hydrogen, you bring oxygen, put them together and you create electricity and all you have left is water vapor. That's incredible. So the future looks bright for the automotive industry. I think it does. I think we're moving in the right direction and I think that we've got to go beyond automobiles. I think we have to have mass transit. We have to have uh, you know, urban centers, you're going to see more and more urban centers around the world. So you have to have pockets where people can come by train, take a bus, a shuttle, rent an uh, electric vehicle without uh, having to do anything but swipe a card or grab their bike. And in the meantime, everyone can go to the conference on practical sustainability. And Kevin, maybe you can tell us one more time how we can register for that. Uh, you can register online uh, by going to www.grpinc.com and uh, we currently have uh, almost half of our available spaces registered so it's important that you register early and uh, be prepared to come and learn about how you can reduce, reuse, recycle and also reap rewards uh, as Andy has explained. Okay, great. Thank you so much to my guests for joining me today. Pleasure and being with you. Thank you. We'll see you again at Elizabeth's Kind Cafe.